body here is the collection of matters, right? Okay, and, and the body here is subject to uh, excitations from the environment. Okay, and then you are interested in the response, like what? The movement, deformation, internal action, like stress, internal force, those kind of quantities that you are, you are interested in, right? Okay. Now, how can we understand the response of the real body or the physical body? You try, there are, there are two ways that you can, you can do to understand the problem here. The first way you can perform the experiments, right? You can go to the lab and then try to build, um, you know, the specimen similar to, um, you know, the, the body or, or the real structure or whatever that you are interested in. So, and then you can perform the experiments to gain data. And that data or response uh, allow you to, um, you know, understand, okay, the basic behavior or, or the response of a problem of interest, okay? And the second way we can, we can do the simulations, right? Instead of doing the experiment, we can, we can try to do the experiment using um, um, mathem mathematics, okay, using some theory. So basically you perform the simulation um, in the computer, for example. Okay, before you can, you can do that simulation, you need to build uh, the representative model that we call the mathematical model, okay? So here I will call idealized body. Okay, this is not a real one, okay? This is uh, what you use to represent the real body, okay? Typically, in solid mechanics, we will take um, uh, the body here uh, as a legion that occupy Euclidean space. You, you know Euclidean space, right? Okay, so you, you, you said, okay, the body that you are interested in can be uh, represented by a legion a lesion in Euclidean space, okay, here. So you can see that the real body, which is a correction of, of particles or material particles or matters, okay, can be represented by a lesion in a three-dimensional lesion in Euclidean space, okay. And then you can represent the excitation like, um, for example, if you look at the structure, okay, you have the interaction with the environment, like you have um, earthquake, okay, excitation, you have seismic loading, you have wind loading, for example. So, uh, or even for the cell weight of the structure, those kind of excitation can be uh, modeled in terms of the contact or the remote forces, right? You learn about this from Dr. Chiarpo, right? You can you you can distinguish between a contact force and the remote force. Can anyone here explain to me what what are the difference between the two here? So we have the contact force and we have the remote force. They are different, right? You learn about this from the first part. Is that right? Okay, no answer, no response. So I, 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 will, I will assume that, okay, you learned about this before. Okay, um, the interaction with the environment come in, in terms of the loading, like forces, prescribed forces. Also in terms of the movement, because, um, you know, the body may be restrained or constrained by, um, like for example, the foundation. So the building uh, will, you know, will 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 be, will be constrained uh, to prevent the movement, the rigid body motion by the foundation, for example. So so you you when you try to uh, represent the real body, you will you will specify the point on the body that you know the displacement or you know the rotation, for example, or you, you call that car point the support, right? So, so that is the part that, that we uh, got from the modeling too.
a second. Okay, so you, you can see in the, in the picture here. So you learn about the contact force. Typically in solid mechanics, the contact force is, is known as the traction ring. It's a force that apply to the body, to the surface of the body. It's a force per unit area, right? So you are family with that one. And also uh, the remote force, um, that is that is corresponding to you know the body force that that you you learn from from the first part, right? <clears throat> so the body force here is a force per unit volume, right? So and also the known movement that I talk about, I talk about the support, um, I talk about the prescribed displacement at some particular uh, boundary of of the body. Okay, this is the information that we got from the modeling. Um, now, the less point of interest, like the movement, the deformation, and also the internal um, reaction, like the internal force. Those kind of quantities can be uh, described by in solar mechanics in the context of solar mechanics. So we use the displacement, and we use the symbol U here, the vector U here, or um, the components, okay, we, we can represent uh, the displacement by the components, okay, based on a selected um, coordinate system. So, I know you use um, the initial notation here. So, we can represent the displacement by a vector u or the index ui, okay. Um, you know that, okay, the displacement we use to measure the change in position, right? So, I will not go in detail here because you learned this from the third part. So basically we define uh, the function that we call the displacement to reflect the change in position of the material point in the body, okay? We also have strain, right? So um, you, you have the symbol epsilon. So this is second order tensor, okay? Uh, we can represent by the component epsilon ij, okay? Uh, whatever which one that you prefer, you can, you, can, you can do both if you want, okay? So uh, basically it's a train that we defined before, okay? We use that to, to measure the deformation, okay? So basically it's a train we use to measure the deformation. What is the, what is the difference between deformation and chain in position or deformation and displacement? You, you know the difference between the two, right? They are not the same. They are not the same quantities. Right. Can anyone here explain the difference between displacement and deformation? What 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 is the key difference between the two? The reference frame, right? No. Right. The deformation is just uh, when the when the uh, when the material just deform, it doesn't, uh, uh, and the uh, displacement is like the rigid body motion. No, I don't think that's right. It's not totally right, right? So, so if you take a look at the definition of the displacement and strain, um, the displacement that I talk about here is not just simply the rigid body motion, right? So um, the two quantities here are some, somehow related, right? But they are not the same. If, if you look at the definition of, of the two quantities, the displacement we use to measure the, move, the movement at one particular point, at each particular point, okay? But the deformation here is simply the relative quantities. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot think about the deformation based on the displacement at a point. If if I told you that okay, this point move in that direction, but you cannot, you cannot, you cannot tell anything about about the change in the shape, the distortion, elongation, twisting based on the displacement at particular points, right? So. To talk about the deformation, the chain in the shape, the elongation, the chain in the length, the distortion, 
those kind of things can can be measured if you compare the displacement between the two points, right? If you try to 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 think about the the elongation of a bar, you know that okay, you will not know that elongation if you if you know uh, the displacement at a point because if you know the displacement at one point at that point, you cannot use that displacement to tell you know about the change in the length, right? You need to compare the displacement at that point with the neighboring points. So that's why when when you when you learn how to calculate strain in the third part, you know that okay, a strain here is related somehow to the derivative of the displacement. What do we mean by derivative of the displacement? Because we compare, right? In the derivative, you need to change, uh, you need to um, compute the difference in the displacement. And you, you divide it by the chain in the position, right? So you can see that strain in that sense is not the absolute quantity, it's relative quantity somehow, because you need to compare this displacement at least to um, compare with uh, the displacement in the neighboring points, okay? Go back and think about that. And your friend has said that, okay, uh, um, is some, some displacement somehow related to the rigid body motion? I can think of, I think I can, I can use that kind of idea to explain some of the different um, here. So you can think about that. The displacement may produce no deformation. So if, if you introduce rigid body motion, okay, you, you just simply translate the body or you rotate the body, okay, without elongate or dis distort the body. So, so you, you, you see that in that case, the deformation is zero no strain at all based on digit translation. So in that case, the displacement produced no deformation, okay? But there are um, displacements that cause deformation as well. You know that, okay, uh, the deformation cannot occur if you don't have the displacement, but the displacement may not generate de deformation. Is that clear to you? Go back and think about this. I think you learned from the first part already. So I will not even not um, you know, uh, talk a lot about this here. Okay. Um, we also have stress. Okay, we use the symbol sigma, right? And 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 we have the index notation sigma ij. So so basically we do this quantity to measure um the internal force, okay? Internal intensity. Okay, or you can think about um, for per unit area, okay, at any, you know, material points in any uh, direction, okay? So this is also the second tensor, okay? Basically, we have um, three groups of response that we are interested in, right? Displacement, strain, and stress, okay? Now, um, if if we would like to get all these quantities, so we need to, we, if, if we want to get displacement, strain and stress of a particular body, let's say that we look at the body down here, okay, and, and the body here is subject to like loading on the battery, that, that the specified traction here, and also we have the body force. One, the body um, is subject to those kind of loading conditions. So it will produce the displacement, right? It will produce a drain inside and also produce a stress as well. How can we get all of them? Before we can get all of them, we need to know the basic equations that uh, link between all the quantities here. Those kind of equations we call the field equations, okay? So uh, at any interior point in the body, at any point X in the body, okay? Um, you learn some of the equation that relate all this quantity before, right? The first one that you should be familiar with, we call equilibrium equation. Equilibrium equation here is simply the equation of motion for the special case when the acceleration is zero. So um, this is the form of equilibrium equation. We have sigma i j comma j plus b i equal to zero. Okay, actually the original form, it should be sigma j i comma j plus b i equal to zero. Can anyone 
tell me why I can switch the index i and j. Sigma i j comma j plus b i equal to zero, or sigma j i comma j plus b i equal to zero. They are equivalent. Because what? Because the stress is symmetry. Okay, that is right. What, how can we know that the thread is symmetric? How can we know that? How can we know that the thread is symmetric? No answer. Can we prove that the thread is symmetric? How can we prove that? I think um, Ajahn Thirupong um, covered that in the third part. How can we prove that? So we examine the moments of the of the, the uh, of the what uh, infinitesimal stress block and we okay so basically basically you just simply force equilibrium of moment right so if you look at the equilibrium of the moment at any point in the body, you end up with sigma ij equal to sigma ji, right? You're going to get something like this. That is based on the conservation of angular momentum, right? And all, all you can think about equilibrium of moment, okay? Based on the assumption that, okay, the body force here is just simply um, um, the force, not the dipole. Okay, this is not the, the, the couple, it's just simply the body force, the force per unit volume. So if you have only that kind of force, so sigma ij and sigma ji have to be the same, or straight is symmetric. And um, that condition is enforced entirely in this class. And, and I would not talk about um, equilibrium, of mo uh, equilibrium of moment in, anymore, because equilibrium of moment is equivalent to symmetry of stress. So uh, from now on, I, I will say that stress is symmetric. So now I, I don't need to talk about equilibrium of moment because it will be satisfied automatically whenever stress is symmetric, okay? So um, the equilibrium equation that I mentioned here is simply equilibrium of force or conservation of linear momentum, okay? That, what you learn from the third part. You can see that uh, this equilibrium equation connect what? Stress, right? And also um, the Lee mode force. The body force is the Lee mode force. So this tell you the connection between uh, Lee mode force and stress, okay? Kinematics, you learn this. From the third part as well, you have the relationship between strain and displacement. They are not the same, but they are not independent. Okay, the quantity here and there, they are not the same, right? One is used to measure the chain in position. And the second one, we use that to represent the formation of, of the body. The two here are different, but they are linearly related. Somehow, if, if you look at the, the case that the displacement is fin infinitesimally small, so, so we have uh, the relationship that you call strain displacement relationship. That is the linearized version. Okay, I, 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 I didn't talk about um, large displacement. Okay, in that case, you have the second part that, that is not linear. Okay, so here, you can see that we have the, the connection between strain and the displacement. So this is the go governing equation that we call the kinematics or the motion, look at the, the motion of, of, of the body and the deformation as well. And, and the last 
set of equations that you should be familiar with. This is the final topic that Ajahn Thirapong cover in the class, I guess, at least for, for uh, linear um, material. So we have this hook laws, right? You, you guys should be familiar with this. So we have sigma i, j, go to c, i, j, k, l, epsilon, k, l. So I, I will try to uh, present the more general form for linear elastic material, okay? And, and c, i, j, k, l here are material constants, okay? How many independent constants do we have here? How many constant, how many constant do we have here? And how many of them that are independent? Uh, and what is, the, what, what is the property of this constant? Okay, I will, I will let you think about this for two minutes and you can tell me about that. Think about that. I will be back in two minutes and, and you have, you guys have to answer me, okay? Okay.
Any answer for my question? How many how many constants do we have here? We have 81 constant, right? So that is total constant that we have, but not all of them are independent, right? Because we have we have the symmetry. You know that Cij Kl is equal to C J I K L, right? You can switch um, between the first two indexes, right? And and that is the same as C I J L K. You can switch um, between the two uh, the last two indices. And also you can switch between the first and the second pair, right? We have C K L I J. Okay, so we have the symmetry. All of them here are the same, right? Okay, so based on this, we can reduce from 81 to 21. Okay, one of your friends that, that said here, um, okay, there's some answer here, but um, because you, you, you provide less detail about your answer, so I don't know that it's correct or it's wrong. So. So we have 81 constants because we have four uh, free indices here. So we have 81, 81 components. Only 21 are independent because of the symmetry that you have here. I think uh, Zhang Jiropong uh, told you how to prove why these two can be switchers and that two as well. And also this pair and that pair. So I will not show it here. So. For general anisotropic material, so we have 21 constant, 21 independent constants. Okay, but you can further reduce to, um, for example, if you look at the monoclinic system, so you can reduce further to 13 constants, right? And if you look at, for example, autotropic material, so you can reduce further to nine constants. All for the simplest one that you, that, that you can deal with, it's an isotropic case, right? So you have only two independent constants, okay? So that is the material properties. Okay, if you don't like this expression that express uh, stress in terms of strain, you can invert this to get um, strain in terms of stress as well, okay? So you, you can write down uh, this equation in an equivalent form like this. And Cijkl here, we call the modulus or the moduli material uh, constant. Um, S here, we, we call the elastic compliance, okay? So they are equivalent, okay? You, you just pick one of them. It depends on which one that, that convenient for, for the problem that you look at. Because if you know stress, you want to get strain, the second one is better in that sense, right? But if you know stress and you want to get stress, the first one here is better in terms of the calculation, okay? The material constant here can be obtained from the experiments, okay? You cannot take that out of the air, so, so you need experiment to, to get uh, those kind of properties for the real materials, okay? <clears throat> uh, we also have the conditions at points on the battery. For example, point X that sit on the battery, uh, we have the conditions that we call the battery conditions. So we have two types of the condition. The first one results directly from equilibrium. So, so we know um, the relationship between stress at that particular point and the prescribed traction. So let, let um, T0 here uh, is the prescribed Traction. So, so basically, this is related somehow to the contact force that I talk about here. Okay, the contact force here is the one that you prescribe at some particular point on on the surface of the body. Okay, so that have to be related to stress somehow from the equilibrium. I think you 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 learn how to do this. This is we call the Cauchy formula, right? So so 
you you can you can derive this easily based on um, the tetrahedral um, um, argument, right? And you 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 I think you saw that in in a John Tierpong class, okay? So this this indicates that stress at any point on the boundary is not independent of traction that's prescribed there. They have to be related somehow uh, via this Quashi formula, okay? And also we, we can have the kinematical condition at some particular points because uh, in, in the real body, you, you don't allow um, the body to move, you know, rigidly, or you don't allow rigid body motion occurs in, in the body. So in that case, you have to constrain the body somehow properly, right? So in that case, we know at some particular point on the body, the displacement and um, some 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 quantity related to the displacement. But here for for the problem that we are interested in, let's say that okay on on this part of the boundary, we know the displacement. Okay, U I zero here represent the component of the prescribed displacement. So U U zero can be zero or non zero. So for for several cases. Um, U0 is not zero because you may have the, the settlement of, of the support, right, in, in the real structure. So, so U0 here can be non-zero, but it's prescribed, okay? So this, what I, I mentioned here for the known movements, because at some point, for, for example, at the point of the support, so we know the displacement, okay? So now if we look at the unknowns that we have or the less bond, the unknown less bond that we have, so we, we introduce displacement, strain and stress. So how many unknown do we have here? So if you count all the components, each component is a function. So now we have 15 unknown function, right? Because displacement, strain and stress are function of X. So so they are functional position. So, so now we have to deal with 15 unknown functions. Okay. How many equation do we have here? How many equation do we have here? So we have, um, uh, we have three equilibrium equation, right? Right. Kinematics. We know that the strain is symmetric, right? Based on the formula that you got, so we have only six independent equations. So based on the index that we have here, it seems that we have nine equations, but only six of them are independent. Okay, we count only the independent um, equations. So so we have six uh, equations for kinematics, and and for, how about this one? And you know that okay, sigma i j is symmetric based on equilibrium of moment. So, so we also have six equation here, okay? Now, if you count the number of equations that's available, so we have 15 equations. So the number of equation and, and the number of unknowns are the same here, okay? This is what you learned before, right? So this is not new to you, is that right? Okay, so this is the part that that I talk about that is the basic material in, in, in linear elasticity. So, so now I will try to put them together to, you know, to formulate the problem that we are interested in. Okay, do you have any question about anything here for the first page, for slide here? I try to review the material that, that you learned from the first part, okay? But not in very detail, but, but the basic concept, the overall picture of what you have learned before. Any question about anything here? No? Okay. Now, I start for, for, formulating Barry value problem. What do I mean by that? So let's say that again, now I focus on um, the idealized body. I will, I, will forget about, I will forget about the actual body because now, we, we try to represent the real body by um, the idealized one, 
and then I I will deal with this idealized body. Okay, I will select the theory to explain the response of this body. Okay, with the expectation that okay, the thing that I come up with here can allow me to understand the real things. Okay, so now I will try to look at the mathematical problem here. Okay, um, what do I mean by Barry value problem? It's just simply the problem that I formulated using the, all the condition, all the equation that we have that, that you learned before. Okay, put them together and, and uh, formulate that as a mathematical problem. Okay, so um, here we, we try to form the mathematical statement of the problem. Okay, that, that is the Barry value problem. So, so we try to form the mathematical statement of the problem by integrating what? All known data, okay? The data that you got from the modeling of the real problem, the, those data come into play here, okay? We have to take into account all known data in the formulation, okay? We have to state clearly the unknown response of interest, okay? Or unknown response to be determined, okay? And also, we need to tell in the formulation clearly the governing equation and the condition that all unknown here have to be satisfied or how the unknowns here related to the known data, okay? So this is simply uh, what I mean by boundary value problems, okay? Um, to get the Barry value problem, the first thing that you have to do, you have to identify known data, okay? What do I mean by known data? Everything that you got from the modeling and you know from the modeling, okay? The first one is the geometry. To solve the problem, you need to know the geometry of the body. So in the formulation of the Barry value problem, this kind of information is very important. So you need to know the body that you would like to analyze, right? So we need to know the geometry of the body. So I, I, I talk about what? The geometry, I talk about the lesion, right? Because you represent the body by a lesion in Euclidean space. So you talk about omega. And also you talk about the battery. So we have the battery. I, I use the symbol here, there omega here to represent the, the total battery of the body, okay? We need to know body force, okay, or the remote force, the force per unit volume. That is the one that you need to know before you solve the problem, okay? How can we get the body force? We get it from the modeling. For example, if you look at the structure, okay, you know about the cell weight, right? So the cell weight is one specific type of body force, okay? So if, if, if you know about your structure, you know, the material that uh, made up that structure. So now you can estimate the body force, right? Okay, so this one is known actually before we analyze the problem. Um, we need to know the contact force or the traction, okay? At some particular point on the boundary. So here I use the symbol T0. T0 here is, is the prescribed or known traction on the boundary. Let's say that, okay, we know that traction on some part of the boundary, I call the surface ST. So ST here is part of the boundary that we know the traction, okay? And we also know the displacement at some particular point on the boundary as well. So, so let's um, use U0 to represent the, dis uh, the prescribed displacement or the known displacement. And let's say that, okay, for the problem that we are interested in here, U0 is known on the surface SU. Okay, SU is part of the boundary, okay? And if we look at the entire boundary of the body, okay, delta omega here is simply the union of the two surfaces, ST and SU. 
Okay. So what what do I mean by that? So so if if you look at any point on the boundary, you need to know traction or you need to know displacement. Actually, I I have the other condition that S T intersect with S U have to be what? Can anyone hear me? Can you tell me about this? Need zoom, Zhang. What? Zoom, zoom, zoom more. My. This is the empty set. Is that right? Is that what you mean, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, the the two surface the the two surfaces here cannot have a common point. Or you can say that the intersection between the two sets here have to be empty set. What, that, what, what do I mean by that? If you pick one point on the boundary, you, you, you know the traction or you know the displacement, but you cannot know both of them at the same time, right? right? You cannot know the displacement and the traction at, at the same point in the same direction at the same time, right? If you know one, the other one is the unknown. You know that. You can think about the thing that you learn in structural analysis, right? Let's say that, okay, you have the lower support here. You can see that um, you know the displacement in, in the vertical direction at that point, right? If you have the lower support like this, the displacement in, in the vertical direction is zero, but the reaction is unknown, right? So, so if you think about the force in that direction, in the direction that you know the displacement, that has to be unknown. You cannot know the displacement. You cannot know you cannot know the displacement and the reaction here at the same time. Okay, so so ST and SU here, the intersection have to be empty set, but the union have to be the entire boundary. What that, what does it mean? What does it mean? The union have to be the entire boundary because there is no point on the boundary that you don't know both of them. Okay, so at at any point on the boundary, you need to know one of them, only one. But you cannot have a point that you know both of them, and you cannot have a point that you don't know both of them. Okay? So this is the thing that you learned before. Okay, this is a known quantity. What else? Material constants. To formulate the problem, to solve the problem, you need to be able to, you know, to... Uh, represent the material of that body. So it depends on the real problem. If, if the material that made up the body in the real, the real case, for example, you look at steel or you look at concrete, now you have to think about the, the model that can be used to you know, represent the behavior of the material properly. So in this case, let's say that okay, the material can be uh, described by you know, uh, hook raw. Let's say that, okay, so in, in this case, I just focus only on linear elastic material. So, so the material constant that I talk about is CIJKL or SIJKL, one of them. We have four other tensor here, right? You just simply specify one of them. The other one is simply the inward of the other one, right? So if you know CIJKL, SIJKL is known as well because this is the inward. Uh, SIJKL is simply the inward of the four other tensor C, okay? So. Now, uh, one, one, you, one, you get all the unknown data, okay? All the, uh, I'm sorry, all the known data uh, from the modeling. So now you can, you can shoot, okay? You need to shoot the unknown response of interest or the key unknown because you, uh, you, you have 15 unknown response, okay? In linear elasticity, you have displacement, you have strain, you have stress. Okay, you have 15 unknowns, but now you have to pick some of them from that set that and define that as the primary unknown. Okay, you don't need to shoot all of them in the formulation. I will show you later. Okay, or you can shoot all of them. We have 15 unknowns. You can pick some of them and define that as a primary unknown. Okay, this is the important step as well. Okay, you can choose displacement, or you can choose strain, or you can choose stress, or you can choose the combination. Okay. And the next step, we need to talk about 
equation because if you if you try uh, if you try to formulate um, the Barry value problem, you need to show the people about the governing equation and the condition at any point in the body. So let let focus first on the governing equation at any interior point or at any point inside. Just forget about the point on the boundary at, at, at the moment. So look at the governing equation at any point inside. What do we have from what we learned before? You learned with Ajahn Thirapong for the first part. Now you know that we have governing equation or other few equations that I mentioned in, in the first slide, right? Okay. This is example of um, Gobini equation that I talk about. So if you cannot, you cannot ignore the equilibrium equations, right? So um, if you want to identify the unknown less bond of the body uh, in solid mechanics, so equilibrium equation have to be enforced somehow, right? Okay. Now also we we have strain displacement relation. We have stress strain relationship like that okay you pick one of them the first one or the second one they are equivalent you don't need to you don't need to choose both of them right because uh they are not independent right if you pick that one you don't need to use that one okay pick one of them okay that is the important step as well and also you need to identify the known condition at point on the boundary like i told you before if you pick a point on the boundary, you need to know one of them, displacement or traction, okay? So um, let's say that, okay, the body that we are interested in consists of two parts, okay? The boundary can consist of two parts. The part that we call SU, the part that we know the displacement. So on, on this part, we need to force the displacement equal to the one that you prescribe on the boundary. Okay, and this we call the essential barrier conditions. Okay, this is the technical uh, term that people use all the time when you deal with um, the condition, the prescribed condition about the displacement. So you, you call that, okay, you have the essential barrier conditions. Okay, or on the other part of the battery on the surface ST, let's say that on this surface, we know the contact force, or the, we know the traction T0. So um, on this surface, at any point, stress have to be related to the prescribed traction using the Quashi formula. So sigma i, j, and j have to be t i zero. So t i zero here is the prescribed traction, okay? But that one is unknown stress. And here is the unit normal vector, right? It's a component of the unit normal vector to, to, to the boundary. Okay, so, so you can see that um, the unknown are related somehow to the prescribed condition, okay, at the boundary. This is the connection between the unknown displacement and the prescribed displacement at point on the surface SU. And this is the connection between the unknown stress and the prescribed traction at any point on the surface ST. And the second type of the boundary condition here, we call the natural boundary conditions, okay? So basically we have two types of the boundary condition, the essential one and the natural one, depending on the quantity that we know here, right? Okay, do you have any question about anything here? Okay, no question at all. Um, let me move on here. Now, when we get all um, the thing that we need, we get the known data, we specify the unknown less bond of interest, or we choose the primary unknown that we want to use in the formulation. We know the governing equation. We also know the condition on the boundary. So if we know all four components here, now we are ready to formulate the boundary value problem. Okay. 
So this is the form that I talk about. Okay, if I ask you to formulate the value value problem of a specific uh, or given problem, I expect you to get what in the blue box here. Okay, so if I ask you to come up with the final, uh, if I ask you to come up with the value value problem, so I expect you to show me like what I will show you here in the uh, in the blue box. Okay, I need to write out a statement like this. You have to identify the quantity that you want to determine, right? You, you find the, the, the unknown here that satisfy what the governing equation. And then you have to, to tell clear that the governing equation here have to be satisfied for any X inside the body and also satisfy um, condition on the battery. So you can have essential battery condition or you can have natural battery condition and you can have both. So it's possible that for some cases, SU may be empty set. Of some cases, ST can be the empty set as well, okay? Or for the general case, SU and ST are not empty set at the same time, okay? So this is the form of the Barry value problem. So you need to tell me what is this? What is that? And that and that. So you need to completely identify or put all the information in what I just emphasize here, okay? This is the final form of the battery value problem, okay? You have to present in this way, okay? How the known data come into play here? The known data for the specific problem of interest will come into play in several parts here. It comes into play in, in governing equation. It will come into this part for the prescribed displacement, come to that part for the prescribed traction. And the body force come into equilibrium equation, right? So, and material property come into this part because you have stress-strain relationship. Those kind of information have to be specific to the problem of interest. And also the geometry of the body come into play here, right? Okay. So if you try to formulate the barrier value problem for any specific problem, you have to identify or you have to specify the known data that's specific to the problem that you are interested in, okay? Now, I will show you several options for the Barry value problem that you, 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 can, you can get, depending on the choice of the primary unknowns, okay? So let's look at the first case, option one here. So let, let's shoot all the unknown that we have, because you know that, okay, uh, the unknown, the key, and uh, the unknown response for, for uh, you know, uh, solid mechanics that you learned before, you know, you have displacement, you have strain, and you have stress. So basically, we have 15 unknowns. Let's say that, okay, I shoot all of them as a primary unknown, the key unknown here. Okay, I shoot all of them. Okay, now you know that all of them here are governed by 15 equation, right? So the field equation that, that you saw before will be the governing equation for this case, okay? And the final form will be like this, okay? You want to find the displacement field U, strain field epsilon, strain field sigma, such that satisfy all field equation here. Satisfy sigma ij comma j plus b i equal to zero, epsilon ij, equal to one half of ui comma j plus uj comma i and sigma ij equal to um, cij kl epsilon kl like this. Okay, just a second. I, I got the phone call, just a second.
Okay, so we have 15 governing equation for this case, right? And, and this is all the equation that you have to satisfy for, for every point X inside. And also you need to have the, the boundary condition. So in this case, uh, on the surface ST, we know traction, right? So um, on the surface SU, we know displacement. So this is, this is the uh, boundary condition that we have. The first, the first one, this, this is the essential boundary condition and this is natural boundary conditions, okay? You have to state clearly that the first one here have to be satisfied for X, for every X on the surface SU. And this one satisfy for every point X on the surface ST. Okay, this is what I put in the green, uh, in the blue box here is the body value problem of this problem. Okay, and this body value problem is formulated based on um, the choice of the unknowns here. So we use all uh, quantities, displacement, strain, and stress at the primary unknown. Okay, this is one option that you can do. You can always uh, formulate the problem in this way. So this is what I got here. We call the body value problem of this pro of this uh, body. Okay. So what I emphasize in the pink one here, the dash box here. So that represent what? Known data, right? That are uh, known data. That one is geometry. And that one is a prescribed condition, okay? On prescribed displacement on the surface SU. And this is the prescribed traction on the surface ST. And that is the body force. And that is the material constant. And in here, whenever you know, the geometry of the body, you know the normal vector. So what I emphasize here is a known data, okay? Um, we, I have remarks here for this kind of option, uh, for this kind of body value problem. You can see that, okay, the body value problem that, that we formulated here involves 15 unknowns. We have nine partial differential equations and six, linear algebraic equations. Can you tell me nine partial differential equation here? Uh, what? That is that one and that one. These two set of equation combine and you get nine partial, di partial differential equations, right? And that one is simply six linear algebraic equations, right? So you, you have to deal with 19 equation, uh, 15 equation, sorry, okay? So you can see here that the formulation that I have or the formulation that I got here involve several unknowns, 15 unknown functions. And you have to deal with 15 equations as well. So what do you think? The one that we got here, typically this kind of body value problem is not popular. Because if you set up the problem in this way, you need to solve, let's say that you, you plan to get the solution of this problem. This is not the good formulation. Uh, practically, it may be okay conceptually, but it's not be popular. Practically, because if you try to solve this problem by solving all the unknowns at the same time, you have to solve 15 equations at the same time. So it's not easy job, right? Solving a lot of equation and some of them are not linear equation and that some of them are not algebraic equation. They are partial differential equation. You know that, okay? You learn with Ajahn Thirapong in math class, right? He taught you how, how to solve differential equation, right? So if you deal with partial differential equation, it even more difficult, right? Okay, so this kind of body value problem, the formulation in this way is not popular, but people can, can write down the formulation in this way conceptually to see, um, you know, the, all the governing equation, all unknowns that involve, but when they come to solve, you know, the problem, they will not use this kind of formulation, okay? Now, 
if this formulation is not good, practically, what should we do then? So we will we'll try to get better formulation, get the formulation that we have to deal with less unknowns, less number of equations. Okay, that is, um, you know, the goal that we we're gonna do next time. Okay, I will stop here. Um, because we are run off time. Okay, I'll I will come back and and talk about uh how to formulate the value value problem in different ways, with 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 the goal that okay we should get something that better than the 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 option one that we got here. Okay. Do you have any question about anything related to the class uh, material that I, I, I show you? Any question? Yes, Ajahn. Yep. Uh, I want to confirm one thing, Ajahn, about the essential boundary condition and nature boundary condition. Yep. Uh, the, the, the essential boundary condition is my the constraint statement and uh, another is constraint junction. Uh, what I mean the constraints, right? Um, it's not the constraint. It's simply the prescribed condition. For example, if you look at the body, okay, so I, I can separate the, the body of the body into two parts. One part, I know apply force or I know the traction. Because in, in solid mechanics, we define um, the applied force in two ways, right? We have the contact force and we have the, the, the body force. Okay, the body force here is known and it's the remote force. And the contact force, you need to contact with the environment to get that force. So the environment will, will transfer the force to the surface due to the contact. So this is kind of contact force. So in this case, on that surface, you know the traction. Okay, but on the on this part, you you can uh, restrain the body to pre prevent the movement because if you don't want uh, this uh, body to have rigid body motion, you 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 have to find a way to constrain the body. If you think about the real problem, the real building, you know that the 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 building is restrained again the movement by um you know the connection with the ground, right? You have the foundation, for example. So, so how can you how can you model the foundation? You can you can model that as a support, right? So at that particular point, you say that okay, you know the displacement. Okay, so so the modeling that we we did here, we try to connect with the real case, and this part of the boundary is a part that that we use to you know represent. Um, the interaction with, with the environment in the sense that we prevent the movement of the body. So every point on that surface, we say that we know the displacement. Okay, so now um, if we know that condition, we need to set this kind of condition because if you want to make sure that the displacement is the solution of this problem, the value of the displacement at any point here have to be the same as the one that prescribed, right? So at the same time, stress that, that you want to determine have to satisfy the condition here as well, because if you look, if you look at um, this point, you learn from the third part that stress at that point will generate the traction. Traction is generated by that stress field. It's simply sigma multiplied by n. That is the traction generated by stress. But this traction have to be the same as the one that prescribed on the boundary, right? If, if the traction generated by stress is not the same as the one that prescribed, now you cannot say that the body is in equilibrium. So what I try to say here, the condition I, I mentioned here is not the constraint. I can say that this is a condition at, that the solution have to be satisfied or the condition that the unknown here and here have to have to satisfy at point on the boundaries. I'm not sure that I qualify your question or not. And? Yeah, yeah, yes. It's clear okay. for me. 
Yeah. Okay. This is the boundary condition. So we have two types of the boundary condition. Actually, um, the prescribed quantity that that we deal with here are different, right? Are different types. This, this is a displacement and that is attraction. So that's why we classify that into two different uh, groups and we name them differently, okay? Because of the nature of the quantity that we know on the boundary, okay? If we know the displacement, we say that we, we have essential boundary conditions. If we know force like quantities like traction, so now we say that we know track uh, we know natural boundary conditions okay is that clear to you yes Azan. thank you a lot okay anything else more questions nope okay so if you don't have any question i will stop here so i will come back and talk about um the formulation of of the problem in different ways um I would suggest you to um, review the material in the first part that, that I think you learn how to derive Navier equation, right? You learned that in the first part, right? Dr. Tirapong talked about Navier equation before. And also we have Beltomimichel equation, right? Go back and try to review that two set of equation Navier equation and, and Beltomi Michel equation. We we need those sets, you know, in the formulation that I I will I will continue next time. Okay.